evening. Our first facilitator is Melissa Hunter Muller. She is our bylaws chair. We have Andrea Shanahan Stritsky, who is on the bylaws committee, and Deborah Johnson, who also serves on the bylaws committee. And you have myself, Kimberly Sullivan, as your fraternity president, and we have our CEO, Karen Hughes White, also as a facilitator. At this time, I'm going to hand the call over to Melissa Muller, your bylaws chair. Thank you, Kimberly. Good evening, everyone. I am excited to have you on our call to talk about bylaws and our amendments for convention in July. I'd like to start sharing um, what our agenda will be tonight. Um, we're going to do a fraternity bylaws overview, um, just our town hall purpose and guidelines of tonight. We will have our question and answer where we will go through each amendment and answer your questions. And then Kimberly will give all the delegates who are on the call some instructions. So a brief overview of our bylaws. First, let's start with the purpose of the bylaws. They guide our executive board's governance of the organization. The bylaws are the most important legal document of any organization, whether it's a corporation, association, or a partnership. The bylaws outline our day-to-day -day rules for our organization and provide comprehensive guidelines to keep things running smoothly. The bylaws, what the bylaws do not typically cover are day-to-day -day operations. Those are left for policies and procedures. And they also don't delegate initiatives that the fraternity is, is going forth. So the bylaws govern how the executive board governs our organization. One way I like to describe our bylaws, and many of you have probably heard me say this analogy before from previous conventions, but I like to describe our bylaws as a house. They provide a solid structure. So I want you to imagine if a blueprint for a house. It must contain information needed for the executive board to govern effectively and efficiently. A well-built house has rooms that has both windows and doors. Just like a house, a bylaw structure could be built with windows and doors to provide an organization room to govern so that in case of emergency, there's room for the organization to govern effectively. You would never build a house with a room that does not have an escape route, a window or a door to another room. Um, just the same way goes with our bylaws. You, you necessarily don't want to be, not be able to make decisions, but you also don't want there to be such freedom to move that there's too many ways out. There, it provides our structure with a strong foundation. So our bylaws are amended each biennium at convention by the vote of the delegates. The bylaws are proposed by members, volunteers, committees, executive board, and staff. It is a collaborative effort. The bylaws committee, while we lead this charge, we are not the authors of the bylaws. Our members are the authors. We are the scriveners of the bylaws. So we take all of our recommendations and we put them into that bylaws document for you all to approve at convention. You all meaning our members served by our delegates. Our bylaws go into effect immediately upon the vote of the convention floor and our delegates. So once that vote takes place, if a bylaw is adopted, then it is immediately gone into effect. The purpose of the town hall that we're hosting tonight is to educate our members on the proposed bylaw amendments prior to convention. It's also an opportunity for our members to ask questions around those amendments. It is not an opportunity to debate at this time because we will be doing that at convention regarding the proposed amendment. So tonight, again, is an opportunity to educate and for you all to ask questions regarding these proposed amendments. Good evening, everybody. 
It's Deborah here. Uh, for the actual guidelines of how we're going to navigate this tonight, your phone, uh, when you've called in, you're automatically on mute. So if you have questions, where you want to go is in the bottom of the screen, down there in the center, you want to type your questions into the webinar Q&A feature down there at the bottom of the screen. And during the webinar, duplicate questions may not be asked due to the sake of time, but we're kind of coordinating that on the back end as well, thanks to our great staff at Executive Office. In addition, due to time, if we receive an influx of questions, we may or may not be able to handle every single question. If you have trouble with the Q&A function, you can also email your questions to bylaws at trideltaeo.org. And if you could, when stating your question, please reference your, your name and your representative chapter or your volunteer role and the amendment number in question. If there are questions that potentially are outside the scope of the bylaws, they might not be addressed during this town hall, but a fraternity representative will follow up with you after the webinar. If you know your question now, you can jump on in, or even if before the amendment number is introduced, do feel free to ask it via the Q&A feature or on the email, the bylaws at tridelteo.org. So I'll turn it back over to Andrea. Thanks, Deborah. So what we'll do tonight is we will have a summary of the amendment um, where you can, again, ask questions. Uh, we will explain the proposed amendment one at a time, and if there are no questions, we will proceed to the next slide. So some of these will move through fairly quickly if there are no questions. Uh, you'll see the proposed language on your screen uh, as part of the PowerPoint. So I am gonna just go ahead and jump right in to proposed amendment number one. So this proposed amendment number one is identifying the description for the official jewelry for the circle degree pendant. We also would like to share the circle degree pendant design, uh, which is on our next slide. So that is the design. This is not the bylaws committee or um, the bylaws, in fact, determining the design of that circle degree pendant. That has already been established. The, uh, or excuse me, the design is just being added to the bylaws uh, for, for a description purpose. This pendant will be on sale during convention for $10 if you are interested in it, given the beautiful design that you see here. If there are no questions, we'll move on to amendment number two. This amendment is a clarification around fraternity property and surrendering fraternity property. Again, just a clarification here. No questions, we will move on to amendment number three. So this proposed amendment three, oh, sorry, I apologize. We, um, there's two parts to amendment two. So we have two A and two B, but again, both are just clarification of that surrendering of fraternity property. So I think we'll go ahead and move on to amendment three. So proposed amendment three adds language from the corporate bylaws as recommended by our general counsel. So this is a notification for convention. If there are no questions, I will turn it over to Melissa to discuss the next amendment. Thank you, Andrea. The next amendment for question is proposed amendment number four. This adds the language to the directors of the corporation as part of the notification procedures. Any Are there any questions on amendment number four? Okay, moving on to amendment number five. Amendment number five is a rewrite of the convention committees um, just for improved readability. It does not change any of their roles and responsibilities at convention. It simply makes it more clear to those reading it. Any questions on amendment number five?
Okay, amendment number six. Amendment number six provides for the addition of the corporate board to the slating procedures. Um, Tri-Delta's corporation board is elected simultaneously as the executive board of the fraternity and this section and proposed amendment clarifies that this happens. Any questions on amendment number six? Okay, I'm going to pass it on to Deborah. Okay, amendment seven uh, basically strikes a hyphen and adds the word and. And basically the background on this is that the bylaws does define the CEO as both the secretary and treasurer of the corporation and then hyphenating that, we insinuated that that was one role when in fact it is, it is two roles that uh, are fulfilled by one individual. So it just provides clarification to that language. Amendment, are there any questions on seven? I don't see any there. So we'll go on to eight. I see a couple of questions there. Amendment eight is a clarification about uh, the removal of the LDC evaluation from executive board removal procedures. And this proposed amendment amends the wording of the process from an evaluation from the LDC after to, to a consultation with the LDC. So the procedural amendment is congruent with the current fraternity practice. So for example, should the executive board vote to remove another executive board member requiring an evaluation from the LDC, they can remove the director in question, but it limits the board's ability to govern, and two is out of the scope of the LDC's job description. If, the, if there is cause to warrant the director's removal, then the executive board should be able to remove them. And also in amending the word from four to remaining, the bylaws will be inclusive to all situations. One cannot simply assume that there will be always be four board members to vote to remove a fifth board member. For example, if one director is incapacitated during the procedure, only three directors would need to vote to remove the director in question or if there were a situation where two directors needed to be simultaneously removed, there would only be three remaining directors. And this part of the re recommendation was suggested to us by our legal counsel. It looks like we have a couple of questions on eight. Um, what does consultation with LDC mean? And what if the LDC members disagree? As the bylaws committee, we work in collaboration with a lot of our stakeholders, and in this particular case, the LDC. And so if one of our stakeholders is on the call that would like to discuss how we worked in collaboration to come up with that language, we can do that. Melissa, is this something you'd like to address for the questioner? I'm sorry, Karen, you kind of broke out a minute. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so the question around Amendment 8 is what does consultation with the LDC mean and what if LDC members disagree? This is with regard to Amendment Number 8 around EB removal procedures. Yes, thank you. And I am going to... I can answer this question, but I think the best person to answer this question um, is Luann Daniel. Um, I believe she is on our call tonight. Um, she can, she is the LDC chair currently, and she recommended this, proposed this amendment. Um, can someone help me unmute Luann? I think Luann can explain this better than I can. <laughs> Lillian? 
So while they're waiting for to unmute Luann, um, basically with amendment number eight, the previous, as Deborah explained, the previous wording required the executive board in order to remove an executive board member, the LDC evaluation process had to take place. And the discussion when we began evaluating this and Luann raised the question of that this, this really isn't within the scope of the LDC's role. Um, and we evaluated this um, collaboratively. We talked with various stakeholders about the process of what happens with the LDC should an executive board member need to be removed. Um, we also spoke with our legal counsel and it was all agreed upon that within this evaluation that if the executive, if an executive board member needed to be removed, one, the first thing that would be important of is keeping everything confidential and it possibly would be immediately. Um, two, the other part of this process would not to have to wait to have the LDC conduct an evaluation or have an evaluation of this executive board member, but instead they would be consulted with. Um, the LDC would need to be consulted with because soon afterwards they would need to cultivate and elect or slate a new um, executive board member in their place. Um, is the WAN on yet? Can you hear me? I'm here. She is. Thank Hello. you, Luann. If you can explain further, I know you can explain this a little bit better from your role as chair of the LDC. Sure, Melissa. I'm, I'm happy to provide some background here. Um, in the original reading of the bylaws, um, it would be, it could be inferred that the LDC would first evaluate a board member that was who had already been uh, indicated as having acted um, inappropriately, gross neglect of duty, willful disregard. Um, the Leadership Development Committee does not um, actually and regularly see the executive board member. May have lost our connection with Luann. I have messaged this um, member to see if, if the answer so far answered her question. Um, but I'd recommend let's move on. Deborah, um, would you like me to try? This is Michelle Schimberg, and I'm a um, stakeholder interested in this amendment. That'd be great, Michelle. Yes, yeah, please. Um, Really, this, from my perspective, um, when we wrote this bylaw originally, believe it or not, I was involved in that process, um, we knew we didn't have an actual evaluation process that the LDC was conducting um, on the executive board members. And so really, this, the way we've changed the wording this time clarifies the intent of how we originally meant for this uh, bylaw to be in practice. Um, this situation obviously doesn't happen very often, but if someone is unable to act or being grossly negligent, there needs to be a provision for the board to be able to, in a swift amount of time, remove that person from the um from their role and so we felt like the wording consultation with really reflects the practice of what we would be able to do now you asked also about the um what if the ldc did not agree the ldc is a large committee 
and um, there is always a representative on the LDC that interacts with and is the liaison with the executive board. So that person um, would be able to communicate the very confidential reasons why the executive board might be wanting to have this person um, removed. And so it's important that um, there be, we felt like an outside group that would be able to um, kind of oh, not oversee the action, but kind of consult and make sure that they agreed with what the board was doing so that we um, felt like there were protections in place on both sides. And so that's how we drafted this originally back when we added the LDC. Thank you, Michelle. Just an FYI, your video is on. Yeah, now. I'm not sure how that happened <laughs> or how to turn it off, quite frankly. It's, and I'm it's getting the bottom left. people to tell me to turn it off. So it's, if you want to tell it's me. It's the how bottom that. left of your screen, and you just you should be able to scroll down to the bottom and, and click the. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Michelle, you look lovely. Oh, yes, lovely. <laughs> So um, the member who asked that question does feel like her question was answered. So um, Deborah, you can, um, actually she had one other question though back on amendment number two. Um, and her question was around um, more clearly defining restricted fraternity property um, on the surrender of property. Andrea, any additional um, clarity you could add there? Um, so that is, not specifically addressed in this bylaw. Um, the restricted fraternity property. Let's go back to that. Um, so that definition, I we'd have to look in there that um, is to go back into the bylaws more generally and look at the definition of restricted fraternity property. Okay, so should we take that as a, a follow up and then be able to get back to the member who asked that question? Yes, yes, let's do that because it may not actually even be defined. Um, so we'll need to just take a look at that given it's not addressed specifically in the change. Okay, so that'll be a follow up from this group to that member. Thank yes. you. Yes. All right, Deborah. Okay, so Amendment 9 is a clarification in the language. Uh, of our CEO, the language we do in fact employ our CEO um, rather than service. Service implies a volunteer role. So we need to make mm. sure that we are employing our CEO since that's what we are doing. And I think, uh, I'm not sure there's any, I haven't seen any questions on that. So I will turn it back over to Andrea. Okay, thanks Deborah. Um, amendment number 10, so this is regarding notice. Um, allowing electronic notice for meetings of the executive board. So this allows just to revise that procedure to uh, electronically transmit that, that notice. So this again will save on uh, postage for the fraternity in mailing um, and also just makes it uh, more efficient and convenient. So uh, there was a question about the difference between the timing on Amendment 3 and Amendment 10. The timing is different because this is notice regarding uh, the executive board meeting notice, whereas uh, Amendment 3 was regarding convention notice. So two separate topics um, requiring two separate notice periods. Any questions on Amendment 10? Okay, we'll move on to Amendment 11. So this replaces the executive board meeting quorum and voting procedures with, with uh, language that we use similarly in another provision in the bylaws. So we're just trying to be, make sure that language within the bylaws is consistent. Uh, the intent of the orig original subsection has been retained. So it doesn't change that substantively. Looks like there's no questions about 11. We will move on to number 12. 
So again, here, no substantive change. This just essentially rewrites for clarity purposes how the fraternity council is constituted. So we wanted the language to be consistent as, as well as clear um, to describe the fraternity council uh, makeup. Okay, Melissa, I think you're up with number 13 if there's no questions. Uh, Melissa, do you have question amendment 13? It looks like we can't hear Melissa. So um, if she doesn't jump in, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll go ahead and continue unless there's any questions, Karen, that we should address. I don't see any questions yet. Um, there are questions ahead. Um, so let's, let's cover off on 13 and then we'll get into 14. Uh, I'll go ahead and do 13 and Melissa just jump in if you uh, can. So this amendment actually would remove the CEO as the mandated secretary of the fraternity council and give the president the ability to appoint a secretary. So this would um, again remove the president um, as the secretary and give them the ability to appoint a secretary. Uh, just a, a little background on this. So the fraternity council serves as a joint executive council for the fraternity, NHC, and the foundation. And as a result, the boards of these entities may wish to have conversations that should exclude the participation of the CEO. So, for example, if the CEO is not a member of Tri Delta, the fraternity council may wish to discuss ritual-related items without the CEO present. So that was the, the reason for the change here. Okay. Hello, Hello I'm back. Oh, can, you, yes. can you hear me? <laughs> Fabulous. Yes. Not a very good time for my earbuds to die. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, for your assistance. Amendment number 14, is this where we are, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Okay, amendment number 14 has a series of A, B, and C that are contingent upon one another. If um, 14A is not adopted, um, 14B and C will not be proposed. And Amendment 14 introduces the creation of a new standing committee titled the Membership Status Committee. And as you can see in Amendment 14B, where the role of the Membership Status Committee is defined, um, they will be responsible for evaluation and final decision making for membership standing resulting from matters such as member conduct, including termination, academic performance, financial obligations, and reinstatement. And then 14C replaces any provision that states that the executive board conducts an action, instead of the executive board conducting that action, the membership status committee would conduct that action in their place. Um, there is a question on amendment 14 A, B, and C, and I'm going to pull um, Linda McClendon, who was the chair of the member accountability committee, and I'd like for Linda to share with everyone what her role on the Member Accountability Committee was and the direction that they went, um, the pilot program that they went on. Um, and I know Linda can share and answer the question, but the specific question is, what is the justification for the executive board adv adv advocating responsibility to a non-elected committee regarding membership status? Um, and I, see, I think Linda can give you a little background on this decision um, and also answer this question. So, Ms. Melissa, um, Linda is, she dialed in on her cell phone. Yes. Um, and, we're not, and we're not certain we're going to be able to hear her. So we're, oh, we're okay. working, working on a workaround. Um, she dialed into the number, but not through the um, Ring Central app. Um, 
So we're going to give her um, a buzz um, as we work through this. Um, if Kimberly might be able to assist. Um, I, I can provide some background on it as well, starting from where the member accountability committee came from and where, where it went to. Um, in the last, and while everyone's getting ready, in the last biennium, um, there was a task force called the Membership Discipline Initiative Innovation Team, I'm sorry. Um, and recommendations were made around our disciplinary process and led to the creation of the Member Accountability Committee. And Linda served as chair of that committee. I know they are working on getting her on here to answer questions. Um, but we also have the chair of the membership status committee. And Melissa Hall is the chair of that committee. And she is on the call and is ready to have her speak as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Hall. And I know they're still working on having Linda speak as well um, because they are experts on proposing this amended bylaw. Um, so, hi, uh, I'm Melissa Hall, and I'm the chair of uh, the uh, of uh, a pilot version of the member status committee um, and the committee that's being proposed through this bylaws change. Um, I realize that this might um, appear to be sort of an abrupt change, um, but if you've been um, uh, following uh, sort of Tridelta's leadership progression over particularly the last decade, um, one of the things that you will see is that the executive board has moved um, from being a uh, an operational board, um, a board whose members are all up in the day-to-day -day running of the fraternity to a governance board, um, a board that concerns itself with long-range planning and vision for the organization um, a a as a whole. And in that change, which has been, like I said, sort of gradual over the over these ten years, um, the reality is that the um, the detailed investigative work, particularly surrounding member discipline, is quite frankly, I would say, no longer a particular good fit for um, executive board members. Um, because it pulls um, the board as it's now constituted, as it's now talked about in our documents and in our organizational plans, out of that big picture stuff and back into sort of the, the nitty gritty details of membership. So that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is member discipline issues are, um, uh, as as many of you know, they're they're um, sensitive. Um, there's a lot of detail, and um, there's often a lot of investigation. Um, and so, I believe that the thought is that this committee um, is actually in a better position to give um, clear and um, uh, significant attention to each member discipline situation in a way that perhaps the um, the executive board isn't um, so rather than um, thinking of it as the executive board abdicating um, its responsibility it's actually the executive the executive board putting in the hands of volunteers all of whom have significant experience in the discipline realm um, putting discipline decisions in the hands of those Tridelta volunteers um, with the time and the inclination and really the passion for um, working through discipline issues. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, Melissa, that was a great explanation. Thank you so much for giving that background. And as our um, member accountability committee piloted this whole process, um, you know, we shadow voted with the executive board. We took everything, you know, 
situation by situation and, and really felt that by moving this process, like Melissa said, to an independent standing committee who was going to have the time to really do some thorough review and investigation, we're actually going to be able to give our members you know, their due process because we're going to be able to have the dedicated time um, of this committee with significant Tri-Delta um, membership experiences um, to, to work with these, these women and um, you know, support the, the membership process. Um, the executive board, like Melissa said, is a, is a governing board and really the strategic direction of the fraternity and so many key responsibilities that fall to a board level by having a separate committee, we're going to be able to give them um, more opportunity to be active governance, you know, being an active governance committee board and just being able to provide our members with strong due process, sound decisions, and, um, you know, really be able to support this process for everybody involved. And we found by doing the shadow voting that really we were very similar um, in our thinking with how that board the vote outcomes came out at the end of that process. Um, we were able to ask some very thoughtful questions, really look at some different processes and make some recommendations that Melissa and the membership status committee will carry on um, and be able to look even further into to really make sure that we're um, giving our many members as many opportunities as possible um, to you know, be heard and to be, um, have their situations dealt with individually. Thank you, Linda. There's another question regarding the membership status committee, and it is, will the LDC fill the membership status committee? Um, the membership status committee would be a standing committee, and the executive board appoints those committee. Um, their term is the same term as the executive board who appoints them. Um, so the two-year term until the next biennium, they would need to be reappointed um, for an additional term. So it will not be filled by the LDC. Are there any other questions on Amendment 14? Well, special thanks to Melissa Hall and Linda McClendon for answering and, and educating us on the evolution of the membership status committee. Moving on to proposed amendment 15. Proposed amendment 15 focuses on the extension committee. Um, we are removing the number of members from seven to six and deleting um, the director of extension because that position is no longer a position within the fraternity and also revising their responsibility um, to really clarify what the extension committee today does for their role and responsibility. Any questions on Amendment 15? Okay, I don't see any questions on 15. Um, we're going to reverse and go back to 14 for a moment. And Luann, were you going to answer the question regarding the LDC position? Luann, you are um, unmuted and can answer at this time. I have nothing to add, Karen. I'm not sure okay. how that happened. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. I, I had a message that said you were going to answer a question live, so I apologize for putting you on the spot. <laughs> okay, thank you. And moving on to Amend proposed Amendment 16, and Deborah Johnson will introduce that amendment for us. Deborah? Okay, thanks, Melissa. 
Uh, this amendment has to do with clarifying the employee exclusion component of who is eligible to serve on our slated positions. So it really improves the, the clarity of that. It was rather wordy and through lots of effort to clarify that the proposed amendment really does improve the readability of this section and re removes a lot of superfluous language. Uh, the original intent has been retained of what the, the section is supposed to be doing. So it just makes it a whole lot easier to read. So I don't see any questions on 16. So we'll go on to 17. Amendment 17, and thank you, Michelle, for the background on LDC, and we may be calling on you again, and, and Luann as well. This, this uh, amendment talks about the LDC term limits and clarification of LDC chair eligibility. As the LDC has evolved, there has been conversations for, for several years now about how we can fulfill these roles with the most uh, logical uh, competency sets to set Tridelta up to be successful. So this proposed amendment clarifies those term limits for the LDC committee itself and adds a provision to the chair term limit. The term limit for the chair would remain at two terms. However, an individual may be allowed to serve on the LDC as a member for two terms and then be elected as the LDC chair for two terms. The current bylaws limits the selection of the chair to a member who had not served a consecutive term on the LDC, and that limits the eligibility of that chair position. So for example, if LDC member A served one term on the LDC, she'd be eligible to serve as chair, but only for one term. Or consider if member A served two terms on the LDC, she wouldn't be eligible to serve as chair until two years after her expired LDC term. So by opening the chair eligibility to current members serving on the LDC, a larger pool of candidates with those competencies can be considered. Prior experience with the LDC process is absolutely invaluable, and with the responsibility the chair has to facilitate that committee's work. This uh, has been, we have Luann Daniels, I believe, on the, on the phone, and Michelle as well as prior uh, LDC chairs who can speak to this. They have, they have been in those shoes, and so if there's any questions, I'm sure they'll be happy to help us get clarity. I see any questions? So there was just one question clarifying that, um, that the total um, term limit would be a total of two as a committee member, two terms, two to your terms as a committee member, two to your terms as a chair, right? So an individual could, could serve the LDC for a total of, of eight years if she fulfilled um, her entire term limit. Um, this is Michelle, and I, I will say, um, yes, that that would be the very maximum that someone could could serve. We needed to um, clarify this because when we started doing LDC, I feel like I'm, you know, talking about back in the dark ages, the chairman of the LDC was usual, was automatically the past president of the fraternity, and that is no longer a requirement in our bylaws. And so now the chair of the LDC comes from that LDC committee, uh, typically. Doesn't have to, but, but can come from those folks. And so you don't want to limit the pool of candidates because they would already have served their maximum if they happen to have served on two previous committees. The person wouldn't have to be put in that role to be chair, but they could if the LDC decides that's the most qualified person. Thank you. That answers the question at hand. Yeah, Deborah. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, amendment 18, there we are. Amendment 18 is an expansion of the NBC 
NBC, NBC, the NPC uh, eligibility requirements for the National Panhellenic Conference delegate. There's an, there's an importance to our NPC delegate and alternates having had executive board or international fraternity experience. And outlining this requirement in the bylaws limits who can serve in these positions. Several bienniums ago, with the elimination of the associate director position, the number of past elected officers of the fraternity has been reduced. So it's important that the NBC delegate be someone who is current with both fraternity and NPC issues. And so going back to those who served all those bienniums ago would, might, would perhaps not be the most qualified candidates at this time to serve in that role. Removing the eligibility requirements for the NPC delegate and alternate delegates ensures the appointment of the best leader with that skill set for the available position. The role of the NPC delegate includes serving as a member of the board of directors of the NPC. And this person serving in this role should be someone who is able to think strategically, have a vision of the future for, NBC, for the NPC, and have knowledge of current trends on campuses within fraternities and sororities. And the position is rather moving away from an operational one. And the NPC is currently revising the job description of the NPC delegates and the alternates. And those were scheduled to be approved at their board of directors meeting in May. And I'm not exactly sure if that's happened yet because we are in the middle of May. It'll be important for future executive boards of Tri-Delta that we're provided those job descriptions. So when we're appointing our NPC delegation. In a couple of facts and surveys that were done of the other 25 NPC groups, 14 recognize in their bylaws that they have an NPC delegate and three alternates. And their qualifications for those roles are not in their bylaws. Kind of going back to Melissa's description of the house and the bylaws and what should be in our policies. Most of their bylaws state that the NPC, NPC delegation is appointed by their president or their board or council. However, it's up to the president or council to appoint who they feel will best serve in the position. In many cases, the NPC delegate is a past elected officer, and sometimes it has been a past national and international president. But Tridelta feels, and our opponents feel, that it should not be hindered by the fraternity bylaws in appointing the right person for that position. So I know that was a lot all at once. I don't know if there's any questions on 18. If there are, let me know. If not, I'll turn it back over to Andrea. So no questions okay. on 18, Deborah, but there is a question back on 15. Um, so if we could maybe pause and take a step back to 15. Um, the question is, um, who is responsible for investigating the establishment of a new chapter? Um, and I think I'll take this to start with um, and then maybe share this with Andrea, but um, this now is a staff led function. And so a member of our um, member experience team and our um, communications PR team um, typically pair up for on campus investigations in consultation with a member of the NHC staff. After the initial investigation is done, a complete summary goes to the extension committee, which is comprised of the executive board and our NPC delegate for review and um, approval. Um, the approval that is granted by the executive board at that point is the, is the only vote taken on extension. So once they um, agree to submit materials to a new campus, they're actually agreeing to go all the way through the process. So as we've reworked that process, it's really streamlined our ability um, to communicate and to um, complete extension um, in a way that has, has helped us be very successful um, in expanding over the last two years. So I hope that um, answers some members' question on 15. Um, Andrea or others, anything else to add there? No, nothing from my perspective. I think that covers the... Um technical question. And Ian, we're made aware of all campus opportunities through um, a, a vehicle called, a communication called the NPC Bulletin that is released to every member organization at the same time. So 
um, or those bulletins do not come out um, in a regular cadence, um, but rather when um, opportunities present and NPC shares with us. So I, th I think that should, should get it. Okay, great. Okay, well, we, with that, we'll move on to Amendment 19. So I have both Amendment 19 and 20. Um, so these, uh, these two work together at Section 1B and 1E. So this proposed amendment removes a sp specific procedure and replaces it with a more general procedure for establishing a new chapter. So this may actually um, tie Karen into your explanation of the process um, for Amendment 19 as to um, the collegiate chapters being established after the unanimous vote, vote of the board, uh, the completion of membership selection and or the intake and formally pledging its members. Um, the other thing that this, uh, these two bylaws do, so Amendment 19 and Amendment 20, um, is that they're going to remove the term colonization. Um, given that the term colonization really hasn't been used by Tri-Delta in recent years, um, we believe that a more um, a, a better use of the terms here would be to remove that colonization reference. So you'll see it removed here in Amendment 19, um, as well as um, then Amendment 20 is 1E. Any questions about Amendment 19 or 20? Okay. So we will move on. It doesn't look like there's any questions. Um, so we will move on to Amendment 21. So um, let's see. We will move to Amendment 21 on the slide as well. So this is a replacement. We um, cleaned up this section uh, quite a bit and um, replaced the term probation with disciplinary action. So um, it's more appropriate as we went through the reading of the information within this disciplinary section to replace the word probation with the more general term of disciplinary action. So collegiate chapter disciplinary action as defined by the bylaws includes more than just chapter probation. So by using, using this umbrella term of disciplinary action, the fraternity will be able to have varying degrees of discipline without being committed to the word probation. So we also combine subsection D and E so that the bylaws do not contain repetitive language. This, again, this amendment does not change the current procedures for chapter discipline, just uses uh, more broad terminology to encompass uh, the disciplinary action rather than just specifically probation. So um, chapter probation will still exist, um, but it is, a, as I said, it's a form of disciplinary action. Any questions around that? It doesn't look like it. So Melissa, you're, um, you're scheduled for Amendment 22. So um, if you wanna, I'll turn that over to you. Uh, 23 is gonna jump back to what I just talked about, but we'll go ahead and turn it over to you for 22. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Sure. Okay, proposed Amendment 22 redefines the alumni chapter definition. And we, in making this, this recommendation was received and we evaluated it and discussed with our legal counsel and our legal counsel also agreed that this was a more clear definition of the alumni chapter, um, reduced a little bit of liability with including all of the groups that were originally outlined and making it a little bit more succinct. Any questions on amendment 22? Okay, seeing none, we will go to proposed amendment 23. And as Andrea pointed out, 23 is the same explanation that Andrea shared with amendment 21, except that the difference is it applies to 
the alumni chapters. Um, so again, the language was made a little bit more clear. Um, and we, um, this section already used the umbrella term disciplinary action. Um, so it looks a little bit different, but it's the same premise of using a broader term so that um, additional terms could be used for an action. Any questions on 23? Okay, proposed amendment 24. Proposed Amendment 24 removes the requirement for a potential to new member to have a reference in order to be extended a bid into membership. Now, what this bylaws amendment changes in operations, um, there are chapters who receive many references and they utilize those references to get to know those potential new members, and it is wonderful. We, Tri-Delta wants all of our members to write references. We hope that chapters receive references. Um, so this proposed amendment would not change what these chapters are doing in, in the chapters are receiving references. What this reference change is the main outcome is for chapters that do not receive references, um, the procedure currently is for those chapters, if, if a potential new member goes to our preference round and we want to extend them a bid, the evaluation committee sits down and writes a reference and then submits them on behalf of the women they'd like to extend bids to. Um, this paperwork is, is not necessarily doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't go to executive office, it's typically kept in a file at a chapter level, and it isn't an efficient use of our chapter's time when the women are already voting a potential new member into membership um, for them to write a piece of paper. So um, what this proposed amendment would do is eliminate the need for an evaluation committee and eliminate the need for chapter members or advisors or an advisory team to write references on behalf of women who do not have references, volunteered references. Um, there is a question on Amendment 24 and stating that, it, would it mean that we would not submit PREF night forms at all after PREF night? And I'm interpreting this as meaning that you would not submit any, you would not have to write a references for any potential new member that did not receive a volunteered reference. Um, so if you had 20 members on your pref night list or that you're extending bids to, if 10 of them did not receive members, the other 10, you would not need to fulfill and fill any paperwork out. Um, hopefully that explains and answers that question. Are there any other questions on Amendment 24? Okay, seeing no more questions um, on Amendment 24, I will pass the mic over to Deborah for Amendment 25. Thanks, Melissa. Amendment 25 is in the section of our bylaws under membership regulations. And this proposed amendment removes the indication of who imposes probation on a new member and replaces it with inclusive terms. So specifically, we're talking about collegiate members and eligibility for initiation. This amendment does not change the procedure which would prohibit a new member from initiation if in the individual disciplinary action. The amendment does remove specific terms and replaces it with the more general terminology of disciplinary action, similar to the logic of uh, Amendment 21. We had a question over here, um, the significance of removing this line, and actually two, who else would be giving disciplinary action, the college itself and related to Greek life? And I know, um, 
Andrea, you've been involved with this. Don, I believe, is on the call as well from executive office. The line subject to disciplinary action, it is it allows it to be a more general term. And we're specifically discussing about eligibility for initiation. So it's a very specific instance that allows us to confer that initiation on that new member. So to me, it, it makes sense why that is significant to have it be in a more general terminology. But maybe there's another stakeholder on here that could explain that a little bit better than I at this point. Deborah, this is Melissa. Yeah. Um, the recommendation came from Nicole Hughes, um, executive board member, and she recognized that this subsection three had a list that included the executive board with the creation of the member status committee. Um, the executive board would no longer be making those decisions. The membership status committee would. Um, however, the collegiate chapter also would be included. And so rather than having a list of all the ent entities and individuals that can subject discipline action on a, on a new member, um, we just left it as a, a general term so that the document was not just a list, a running list of all of those who are eligible to, you know, have discipline action on a new member, but instead just having that general term. So that's, that's where the, the evolution of the language came from for this proposed amendment. And technically, Melissa, this is Nicole Hughes. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Um, you know, one of the things that caught our eye is that technically there is not a procedure for the executive board or now the um, membership status committee to place a new member on probation, right? So um, probation for new members is totally at the chapter level or they terminate the member. Um, and so this was to um, just sort of... Um, create a general description of um, a provision of ineligibility for um, for initiation which is being on you know being the the subject of the disciplinary action regardless of where it came from in the fraternity right and there there is not a procedure that the fraternity uses Nicole but the bylaws does allow for the the um, the executive board or now the membership status committee to place a new member on fraternity probation. Um, it rarely occurs, but there is a provision in the bylaws that does allow that. So there could be an entity or, you know, a group besides a collegiate chapter that, that is able to propose disciplinary action on a new member. Oh, good point. Thank you. Any other questions on Amendment 25? Okay. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Nicole. Amendment 26. Amendment 26 has an A and a B. And if, if proposed Amendment 26A is not adopted, then 26B will not be proposed. So let's begin with 26A, where this language really there's quite a lot here to to further and a lot of stakeholders participate in this a lot of our committees everyone from the ritual committee member experience the inclusion task force um, collegiate team volunteers executive office staff to really clarify and engage with our inclusivity and engaging our our members in their membership for life and how we could get that language to truly be clear for all of the different types of members that exist. In 26A, this proposed amendment adds enrollment as a defining factor of collegiate membership. It deletes superfluous language and clarifies the status of, of an affiliated collegiate member whose chapter has closed. So that's the first one. 26B proposed amendment clarifies the alumna member definition and replaces language in this provision with language used in similar ones and adds a definition for, alum, for an alumna member's collegiate chapter designation. 
These also tie in with Amendment 27. So it's kind of, you got to look at all three of them really together. Amendment 27 redefines the eligibility for circle degree. It deletes subsections A and C and replaces a phrase within D, <laughs> follow along here, replacing senior with collegiate member and replacing executive board with designated fraternity representative. Affiliated collegiate member, this amendment adds enrollment, as I mentioned earlier, as a key factor to the eligibility for being a collegiate member. While the bylaws stated a member must be enrolled in an institution with an established chapter upon initiation, it left room for interpretation in the collegiate member definition. By adding enrollment as a key factor to being an affiliated collegiate member, the bylaws adds clarification to what it means to be affiliated with a collegiate chapter. We further discuss transfer members and removing the designation of chapter of origin from this subsection. The unaffiliated collegiate member is reserved for members who intend to take a break from school and intend to return to school. It further decide, defines how, if they want to attend circle degree, how they can do that. The alumna member, the new definition allows a member who decides to leave school before academic class, all of those details that we've all dealt with and how they get to an alumna chapter. Under previous provisions of the bylaws, that was a little more complicated and this makes it a lot simpler for that member to take circle degree and continue her en engagement and involvement as a Tri Delta. With respect to the circle degree, it gives the benefits of, of continuing, like I said, that member engagement and gives the permission to attend circle degree. Again, like Nicole had mentioned earlier, taking some of those day-to-day -day operations out of the board role and allowing other designated fraternity representatives to do so. I think that is about enough. I've probably gone on enough about 26 and 27. <laughs> Are there questions on those? at all okay um, wait deborah there is a question on 26 b 26 um, yes and this is um from a member who uh sent this question via email automatic designation of alumni members of affiliation appears counterintuitive to the ideals of fostering membership and lifelong sisterhood or anything beyond a social media presence with fraternity following graduation why continue this practice? Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, Deborah, I can take that if you okay. if you want. Perfect. That'd be great, Andrea. Oh. oh, okay. Well, thanks, Jessica, for that. Um, so we we do agree with the importance of fostering uh, lifelong sisterhood, but the bylaws committee intent in retaining this language and moving it to another subsection was logistical in nature. So in this article, uh, the bylaws define how the fraternity identifies members, not for marketing purposes, but for member record purposes. So members who transfer to another school after initiation are free to associate their membership with an affiliated chapter if they wish, and all members are free to not associate with any collegiate chapter. However, the fraternity needs to have a defined method for member records, and the bylaws then makes this delineation with the change that we propose. So we'd like to share your comment with the member engagement committee as well. Um, from an initiative standpoint, uh, we could discuss it at another level outside of the bylaws. So hopefully that answers Jessica's question. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, so I think Andrea, you're up with 28. Is that right? Okay, are we? And no I believe, on wait, I think there is one more question on Amendment 26 that was sent via email. I think so. You're yeah. exactly right. Thank you for catching that. This was sent by Linda Johnson, um, and her question was why female gender references um, are being removed from the bylaws. 
Melissa, were you going to take that one? Yes, I will. Thank you. So Tri-Delta was founded by women for women. And the fraternity bylaws solidify our single sex membership in Article 4, Section 2, at the very beginning of our bylaws, um, via the definition of a member. So Tri-Delta, in this article, Tri-Delta defines a member as any woman who has been initiated into membership in the fraternity, who has not resigned her membership, or whose membership has not been terminated, is a member of the fraternity. So any references to a member throughout the bylaws refers back to Article 4, Section 2. So there is no need for the bylaws to repeat this definition over and over. Um, once in any legal document, once you define it one time, that definition stands for the remainder of the document. Um, so in deleting any gender references as we do in um, article, or I'm sorry, Amendment 26, specifically with the alumni member definition, in deleting the gender reference, um, that specifically is because it is superfluous language. Um, it is not necessary. Um, so in looking at this specific language, the alumni definition now mirrors how the collegiate definition is written. Um, so it's consistent language as well. Now, the bylaws committee proposed to remove some of the pronouns within the document, um, also for clarification purposes. Again, in a legal document, any reference to she can become ambiguous because she can refer to many different people. So the preferred language is to reference the member or the officer um, specifically so that any question of who is being referenced can be eliminated. So hopefully that answers Linda's questions regarding any um, gender references being removed. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. So we will work through amendments 28A through D. So um, these, the, the amendments here uh, throughout, there's a couple different sections here, but these proposed amendments delete the certified letter requirement for disciplinary action notice for a member and replaces it with the ability to provide electronic notification. So what the bylaws committee found um, when this uh, what th this amendment was proposed was that um, executive office was averaging between $300 to $450 each month sending the certified letters and um, the majority of them, uh, at least more than half of them, were coming back as unclaimed. So this is a huge expense for uh, the fraternity and is an antiquated communication method for today's members. So there's no legal requirement beyond the current language of the bylaws to retain the certified letter form of communication for termination letters. Uh, just to note that this, in, this amendment was adopted in the interim by the executive board um, in order to reduce the cost um, in the interim as, uh, until we uh, can formally vote on this um, in convention. There is a question, um, it looks like, Karen, I believe, uh, on Amendment 28, and we have Don here to um, provide an answer to that for us. So Don Davis is going to answer a question around how, um, and this came, uh, question came in via email, how will guarantee receipt of communications if we're not using certified mail? So thank you, Don. Can you guys hear me? We got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can send a read receipt on the email, but anybody knows when you get that you can choose to deny that or respond to it um, it's not a whole lot different than a certified letter we have found since implementing this that the members are getting that to their phone immediately the day that we have the board's results instead of never getting it um, not knowing what a certified letter is not having ever been in a post office before so um, they're replying to the email that lets them know of their membership status. So we, I they're they're getting it. Great. 
Well, thank you, Don. Um, and that does cover, I think that the question covers the various uh, A through D um, in 28. Those are all just uh, uh, replacing certified letter with electronic notification. So if there are no further questions on the uh, replacement of the certified letter requirement, we'll move on to Amendment 29. So Amendment 29 is also um, a bylaw that was adopted in the interim. So this proposed amendment deletes the procedure for emergency financial uh, status. In the fall of 2016, the executive board adopted fraternity policy, which eliminated the emergency financial status procedures and consolidated them with procedures for extraordinary membership status, also known as EMS. So this amendment just removes the reference to the emergency financial status to be consistent with the actions of the executive board. Uh, regarding policy. It does not appear we have any questions on 29, so we'll go ahead and move on to Amendment 30. So this amendment, proposed amendment adds in good standing. So you'll see there it's that any member in good standing of the fraternity may submit an amendment to the bylaws committee. Um, we also deleted the undefined terms entitled members. So it um, states there as there's uh, electronic means to entitled members, whereas entitled members was not defined anywhere in the bylaws. Um, and so remove that because again, it was not relevant and was not defined. Um, and then again, makes the amendment to, um, for the member to be in good standing, which is a best practice for member organizations when submitting a, a bylaw, bylaws amendment. don't see any questions on Amendment 30. So we will go ahead with the last amendment, which is I think the bylaws committee, this is our favorite, um, because there are a whole bunch of uh, grammatical things that we uh, corrected throughout the bylaws. Again, as Melissa said, we're just described. Uh, we, we don't, uh, we're not the, the, the actual drafters of this, but we, um, we, we help to clean up the bylaws as needed. So we found some language within and throughout the bylaws that um, needed cleaned up or maybe was um, antiquated or um, could be said in a more sufficient way without changing the meaning of it. And so um, we did that throughout the bylaws and you'll see there's various uh, amendments here. And I, I don't know if there's any questions posed on these, but if there's not, we can go ahead and move on. Okay. All right. It looks like that's the end of the amendment. Well, uh, Melissa and the bylaws committee, I just want to thank you for all of your hard work this biennium. These amendments were very well thought out. You, you all did an amazing job. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Kimberly Sullivan. So I just wanted to wrap this up tonight. You might be thinking, what should I do now? Uh, first, I want you to share and discuss these proposed amendments with your chapter. At convention, we will have a legislation session. Please know in advance um, how your chapter feels about the amendments in question. If you have a comment about a particular amendment, please be prepared in advance so you can speak from the convention floor. There will be a convention bylaws orientation session on Tuesday, June 3rd from 2.30 to 3.30. Please bring a copy of your proposed amendments to convention. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions or you're anything like me and you get off the call and you said, oh, I should have asked this, please feel free to email our bylaws committee at bylaws at tridelta.eo.org. And if there are any questions that were unanswered during this town hall, which I believe we had one, these will be addressed either via phone or email at a later date. I just want to thank all of you for your time tonight. I want to remind you that this webinar was recorded and will be available for members who weren't able to join tonight or if you would like to listen to it again. But on behalf of your executive board and the bylaws committee, I want to thank you for your involvement and your engagement in this very important process for Tri-Delta. The future of Tri-Delta thanks you for your time tonight. And I cannot wait to see you in July. Thank you all, and I'll see you in Dallas. Thanks, everyone.